All right, hello everyone. We're going to get started today. Uh, my name is Linda Sonnen, Manager of Public Programs at Illinois Holocaust Museum and Education Center. On behalf of our CEO, Susan Abrams, Board of Directors, staff and volunteers, I am honored to welcome you to today's Lunch and Learn. The Illinois Holocaust Museum's founding principle is remember the past and transform the future. Today's program, Spiritual Resistance in the Camps, focuses on the stories about spiritual resistance by Jews in internment, concentration, and death camps during the Holocaust. A heavy topic, to be sure. But once again, it is the hope that these accounts from the past illustrate the power of the human spirit to find internal fortitude and faith under brutally inhumane conditions. Uh, and may this session offer some insights to strengthen our lives today. Before I turn the program over to Rabbi Brand, thank you to all of our community partners listed on our opening slides for their continued support. And with that, Rabbi Brand, welcome. We are thrilled to have you here today. Good afternoon, thank you so much. Can you see me and hear me? Yes. Wonderful. Well, first of all, I just want to express my personal gratitude to Linda, to Megan who's on this call and to the entire staff and the team at the Illinois Holocaust Museum for inviting me and giving me this opportunity to share the afternoon with you. So thank you for this opportunity and for your ongoing partnership and for the amazing work that you do on behalf of the entire Chicagoland community. It's not bigger. Okay. Our discussion this afternoon is on resilience in the camps. And the word resilience means to bounce back, to be uh, faithful to your original self despite many difficulties. We spoke about this. This is actually the second part for those who are joining. This is the second part of this short series on resilience. So the first this part of this discussion, which I'm happy to share uh, the link to the audio or the video afterwards, we can follow up with Linda, was about resilience in the ghettos. And today we're gonna to focus on resilience in the camps with a very specific lens, the lens of spiritual resilience, the ability to bounce back from indescribable challenge and suffering and difficulty and maintain that sense of identity of a spiritual metal despite that challenge. So as many of you are familiar, there were thousands of camps that were set up by the Nazi regime, by the Germans throughout Europe. And these camps took various forms. There, are, there were six, what we could call death camps, killing centers, but the overwhelming majority, hundreds and thousands of these camps were not death camps. They were concentration camps of various kinds. There were work camps, there were internment camps, there were transit camps. And in each of these places, you can find amazing resilience, which is expressed through people's spiritual and often religious identity. I'll share with you this afternoon, several stories that illustrate the type of spiritual resilience that we are talking about. Let's begin in one camp, not far from Lemberg, from Lvov in Poland, in a work camp, in a concentration camp called Janowska or Janowska. A member, a man who worked in this camp, his name was Rabbi Israel Spira. He was known as the, the rabbi, the grand rabbi of Bluzhev, the Bluzhev Rebbe, and he was interviewed for several stories in this volume called Hasidic Tales of the Holocaust, collected and researched by Yafa Eliach, of blessed memory. Rabbi Spira appears in many of the stories in this volume, and they are, each one of these stories is incredible, and I would highly encourage you, if you have not ever had a chance to read this book, if you're interested in spiritual resistance in, in life, from the spiritual standpoint, the Holocaust. This is an amazing book, Hasidic, Hasidic Tales of the Holocaust by Yafa Eliyach. This story that I'm gonna share with you is on page 155 called Even the Transgressors in Israel. And what it gives you is a perspective, not just on spiritual resistance 
in a camp from the perspective of the rabbi who's telling the story, but of the average Jew. Now, we're not going to over-dramatize this and over-generalize and say that everyone was like this, but these episodes, these individual stories of individual people gives you a window into what existed on a broader scale. Not everyone was like this, but there are pockets like this and we can draw on this from our own uh, in our own lives and thinking about it in a fascinating way. This particular story, said Rabbi Spira, deserves to be published in a book because he's describing the Janowska uh, work camp and a particular man in this camp whose name was Schneeweiss. This man by the name of Schneeweiss was, was known to the Jews in this particular work camp because he had some level of authority and he was known to them from before the war. This particular story has a unique resonance right now as well because we are in the period of time where we are approaching the high holidays, the days of awe. And uh, the story takes place right before Yom Kippur, the Jewish high holiday in which Jews of various backgrounds, of course, those who are observant, but even those who are not observe this as a solemn day of return to themselves, return to God, a renewal, a start of a new day and a new life. And so it was before Yom Kippur that the, the season of the Jewish holidays was approaching. And before Yom Kippur, a, Jew, a group of Jews, a few Hasidim, and they give you the exact names, one by the name of Mendel Freifeld. These are individual Jews who had names and lives and identities. They came to the rabbi, the rabbi of Luzhev, that he should go to Schneeweiss and ask that in Yom Kippur, they should be spared from doing creative labor, which is forbidden by Jewish law. So the rabbi was moved by their request and he was concerned, he was worried to go to Schneeweiss uh, and ask on their behalf, but it was so meaningful to them that he decided he would ask with a heavy heart, he said he would ask Schneeweiss. And he approaches this Jew who prior to the war had publicly violated the Jewish holidays and transgressed against Jewish law. And he was known to be a cruel person, an insensitive person in Janowska with no mercy, Rabbi Spira describes. He comes to Schneeweiss on the day before Yom Kippur. That eve would be the evening of what we refer to as Kol Nidre, the opening prayer, a particular haunting chant that begins the Yom Kippur service. And Rabbi Spira goes to Schneeweiss and he says to him, today is Erev Yom Kippur, tonight is Kol Nidre night. And you are a Jew just like I am. Secretly, I am known here because I am known as the rabbi of Bluzhev. He was a rabbi in this town actually called Pruchik then. He says, there is a group of Jews who would like not to transgress the 39 categories of work on Yom Kippur. Could you please do something about it and give them a work detail? Can you help us? The rabbi noticed a shiver, a hidden shiver went through Schneeweiss and he listened. The stern face of Schneeweiss changed. For the first time since his arrival in Janowska, there was a human spark in it. Tonight, I can't do anything, said Schneeweiss, but I have no jurisdiction. But tomorrow for Yom Kippur, I will do whatever I can. The rabbi snook Schneeweiss's hand in gratitude and left. Parenthetically, I'm going to skip the next section of the story, but this is amazing how they came back to the work camp, to their bunk at one o'clock in the morning after working in the cemetery. And then they said Kol Nidre, which is itself an incredible story of spiritual resilience to recite Kol Nidre in the Janowska work camp. But we're going to skip that section to the next part of the story where this small group of detail of work of uh, Hasidim were called to the Schneeweiss's cottage. He had better accommodations than the others because he was kind of like a capo, an overseer. And he said, Schneeweiss said to them, I heard that you prayed last night. I don't believe in prayers. In principle, I even oppose them. But I admire your courage. For you know well that the penalty for prayer in Janowska is death. With that, he mentioned them to follow him. He took them to the SS quarters in the camp to a large wooden house. You fellows will shine the floors without any polish and wax, and you, Rabbi, will clean the windows with dry rags so you will not tr transgress any of the 39 major categories of work. He left the room abruptly without saying a word. So here you have 
Jews who in years past would spend this day in solemn reflection and prayer and observance of Yom Kippur, still committed, these Jews committed to observing Yom Kippur to the extent that they could here in this cursed work camp. And not only that, Rabbi Spira describes that they sang to each other. As they polished the floor, they began to sing and pray together and chant. He says, the, war, the, the floor was wet with our tears. You can imagine the prayers of that Yom Kippur, said Rabbi Spira. At about 12 o'clock noon, the door opened wide and into the dorm, the room stormed, according to his language, two angels of death, SS men in their black uniforms. Now listen to what happens. Listen to the climax of the story. It's incredible. They were followed by a food cart filled to capacity. Noon time, time to eat bread, soup, and meat, announced one of the SS men. The room was filled with an aroma of freshly cooked food, such food as they had not seen since the German occupation. White bread, steaming hot vegetable soup, and huge portions of meat. So what's happening now? The Germans know that it's Yom Kippur, and now they're trying to steal from the Jews their ability to observe this fast day. You must eat immediately, otherwise you'll be shot. None of them moved. The rabbi remained on the ladder, the Hasidim on the floor. The German repeated the order. The rabbi and the Hasidim remained glued to their place. The German repeated the orders. Nothing happened. The SS men called in Schneeweiss. Schneeweiss, if the dirty dogs refers to eat, I will kill you along with them. Listen to what happens. Schneeweiss pulled himself to attention, looked the German directly in the eye, and said in a very quiet tone, we Jews do not eat today. It is Yom Kippur, our most holy day, the Day of Atonement. You don't understand, Jewish dog, roared the taller of the two. I command you in the name of the Fuhrer and the Third Reich, Fress. Shneer Weiss composed his head high, repeated the same answer. We Jews obey the law of our tradition. Today is Yom Kippur, a day of fasting. The German took out his revolver from his holster, and pointed it at Schneeweiss's temple. Schneeweiss remained calm. He stood still at attention, his head high. A shot pierced the room, Schneeweiss fell. On the freshly polished floor, a puddle of blood was growing bigger and bigger. An incredible story. Because this is someone who before the war did not observe Yom Kippur, ate on this fast day. So what's going on here? He had an opportunity to reach down to a deep place in his soul, in his identity, in his sense of self as a Jew, which maybe he never even was aware of or could never tapped into in a previous life. But now, when the opportunity existed for resilience and for resistance, he took that even at the cost of giving up his own life. Because giving up his own life was an act of resistance and an act of resilience to be true to that identity as a Jew and that camaraderie with the fellow Jews around him whom he helped on that Yom Kippur. Story number one from the Janowska work camp in Poland. Story number two comes from another work camp in another section of Poland called Kunin. Now this book is very hard to get, but I'll share with you on the screen a picture of it. Let me see if I can get it for you. Hold on, I'm gonna pull it up. It's gonna be a little hard uh, for those who, um, okay, let's see, here we go. This book is a Hebrew volume called Ale Meroros, which literally means bitter herbs. And you see on the top, there is a title of this section called Zichronot, Remembrances, Machaneo Avoda, the work camp, Kunin. This is authored by a man Rabbi Yehoshua Moshe Aronson, who was a rabbi in Poland before the war, ultimately did survive, just like the Grand Rabbi of Bluzhev, came to Israel and became a rabbi in Petach Tikva in Israel. And he's describing the Seder night in the war camp. He describes, I'm going to translate it, even though you see the Hebrew on the page, I'm going to translate it freely. He says, we had a Haggadah that night. What it means we had a Haggadah? It means that we had Jews who gathered around, even in this dirty, abandoned, horrible, wretched place, a work camp called Kunin in their barrack, Jews were committed to observing the Passover Seder. They had no matzah, although he describes they had plenty of moror, plenty of bitterness. 
plenty of myrrh that they uh, that they had. They had. They actually did get some wine. They had some some mora, some karosis. He says they began to recite the Haggadah, the traditional prayer, and then after Kiddush, they recited. They were arriving at the blessing of Shachiyanu, thanking God for arriving at this day. On the third line here in the Hebrew, the second line, he writes, "Partsu kula bebechi mar shenimshach kemachtes hashem." When they got to that blessing, they cried and they kept crying for 30 minutes. They couldn't stop crying. And he said, they looked at each other and they asked, how can we recite this blessing? How can we recite a blessing to thank God for getting us to this point? How could it be? How is that possible? To thank God for what we have right now. And yet he said to them, it says in the Haggadah that we, we tell the story of the Exodus, Yemei Chayacha, the days of your life during the daytime, Call Yemei Chayacha even at nighttime. The night symbolizes darkness. The ability to have resilience and to tell the story of redemption even when it's dark outside, to thank God for that opportunity as well. And they continued to recite the remainder of the liturgy. This is another example of resilience where before the Pesach Seder was joyous and festive with people's families gathered around and children and grandparents, and now it's in a work camp. And yet, to be able to say, despite that circumstance, we're going to stand up and we're going to still be true to that original identity, tremendous resilience. One more example before we take questions. We're going to take questions once in the middle and then um, toward the end. I want to take you to another camp much farther away. Take a look at this picture. You're actually going to see a photograph of a young woman, and uh, you'll be able to see what she's doing here. Let me share the screen for a second. Uh, I hope you could see the picture on the screen. Maybe a thumbs up. Uh, Linda, can you see it? Can you see the picture? Yes, yes, we can. Great, thank you. So this is a picture in a place called Westerbork. Westerbork was actually a, not a work camp, it was a transit camp in the Netherlands where Jews were transported after they were uh, rounded up in various places in the Netherlands. They were taken to this transit camp called Westerbork where they were sent either to Auschwitz or most of them were sent to either Auschwitz, almost everyone was sent either to Auschwitz or to Bergen-Belsen. This is a picture of a young woman lighting Hanukkah candles in Westerbork. There's more, if you're interested in Westerbork, there is a volume called Letters from Westerbork by a woman by the name of Eddie Ellison, H-I-L-L-E-S-U-M, who describes things that were going on in the camp. And there's also uh, several reflections on Westerbork by a man by the name of Joseph Pollock in a book called After the Holocaust, The, Bill, the Bells Still Ring. In Westerbork, there was religious life, which is absolutely incredible. Another, another example, another episode, a description of this kind of, of resilience, of lighting Hanukkah candles, or as I have a picture here on the screen, you can't see it, I'm not gonna, but uh, children putting on a play. You can see it uh, zoomed in in the, in the small script. In this group of Jews, turn off the screen share. In this group of Jews um, who were uh, confined to Westerbork was, as uh, Joseph Pollock describes in his book, what he describes as two groups who were not taken in by despair. The first, and I suspect the larger of the two, were the Zionist teenagers. They framed the Holocaust simply as preparation for their inevitable move to Israel and refused to consider other interpretations of their plight. They gathered in Westerbork and Bergen-Belsen and sang the songs of the pioneers of Palestine, and notwithstanding the horrors of the day-to-day -day suffering, were unflappable in their focus and sense of purpose. Around 80% of this group survived. That's section number two, one. The second, he writes, was the Haredim, the pious Orthodox Jews, for whom it was not unusual to spend up to an hour a day in deeply serious Torah study, who in principle never attended any of the cabarets, 
who avoided eating cooked food so as not to violate kosher laws. They, see, they did not seem to participate in the hysteria of Westerbork and intended their incarceration with great shrewdness and extraordinary self-sufficiency. One described to me his bar mitzvah in Westerbork. He spoke to me also of daily religious services, minyanim, around the cots of the barracks. He spoke to me of Torah lectures by the rabbis of Westerbork, which absolutely did not address the tragedy of the hour, but focused to everyone's deep relief and appreciation on matters of Jewish law. I want to turn your attention to meet one such rabbi. His name is Rabbi Avraham Shlomo Levison, Abraham Solomon Levison, who was deported from The Hague. There's a very big, uh, big, massive work on Dutch Jewry from the, which this book comes. On your screen. This is a picture of Rabbi Levison. You can see it. Rabbi Levison was described as one of um, more than 10 chief rabbis from throughout the Netherlands. Describing the work of Chief Rabbi Levison in 1939 to 1940 when he was still a refugee in the camp. So the first part was Joseph Pollock's description of the average man. Listen to this description of the spiritual resilience of a rabbi who's in the camp. With the dark name of Westerbork, the bright name of Levison will always be associated. The name of a man who spent all his Sabbaths and holidays in that camp. It speaks values for his integrity that the inmates of the camp many of whom were rightly or wrongly filled with bitterness toward the Dutch and also the Dutch Jewish officials, should have called him Rebbe Simcha. Rebbe Simcha, the rabbi of joy. Could you imagine? He was nicknamed by the Jews in Westerbork as the rabbi of joy, thus paying tribute to the light he brought into their dismal seclusion. When the disaster which has been threatening for so long finally struck this small, slight figure, and you saw he had that little mustache and goatee with the round spectacles, showed the full magnitude of his bold spirit. With no thought for himself and with great heroism and sacrifice, he fought day and night to protect his people. Unbelievable. It is tragic that so many Dutch Jews should have perished, be perished because of their Judaism rather than for their Judaism. They no longer had the strength of their forebearers could, who could die at the stake reciting Elena L'Shabeach. Rabbi Levison had that strength. Not everybody died for the sake of being tethered to their faith and that level of spiritual resilience. Not everybody. But here was an example of that. He remained constant in peace and in war in Luarden and in Bergen-Belsen. He, he went to his death singing psalms. So I want to transition now to Bergen-Belsen for one minute to close the story which is absolutely incredible story. Because there was another rabbi who was also in Westerbork, who was also sent to Bergen-Belsen, who also died in Bergen-Belsen. Another rabbinic figure, his name was Rabbi Aaron Yisachar Davids. He was the chief rabbi of Rotterdam. He was a colleague of Rabbi Levison. They were both in Bergen-Belsen in 1934. And if you see on your screen, it's a little bit hard to see because I have a Xerox copy of it. You see a handwritten Hebrew passage. I'm going to read it to you. I'm going to read it in Hebrew and in English. Before the eating of leavened bread, you should say with intent, with focus. What are we talking about here? What is leavened bread? We're in Bergen-Belsen in the spring of 1944. Jews are observing the holiday of Passover, where it's forbidden to eat leavened bread, where it's absolutely prohibited, one of the most serious prohibitions in Jewish law, to eat chametz on Pesach. What does it mean, before eating chametz, you should say with intent? This is a prayer that was composed by Rabbi Aaron Yisachar Davids, this Dutch rabbi, together with other Dutch rabbis and Dutch Jews, who were about to observe Passover in Bergen-Belsen 1944. And they were going to violate the law of eating chametz, leavened bread on Passover, but they're in fulfillment of something higher. And that's what they're about to describe to us. 
that even in that circumstance where they had to violate the law, right? Until now, we were talking about Jews who were able to observe the law. Now we're talking about Jews who have to violate the law. And yet they have that res spiritual resilience that keeps them true to their faith. Avinu Shabbat Shemayim, our Father in heaven. This is the prayer that people would recite. It is known and revealed before you. It is our desire, Lasos Ritzoncha, to do your desire with a capital Y. And to observe and celebrate the festival of Passover with eating matzah, and observing not eating chametz. Ah, however, alzos on this doa libenu, our hearts are broken. Shashibud, that the enslavement, and the word shibud, enslavement, of course, reckons back to Egypt and the whole Passover story, while they're right now in Bergen-Belsen in a concentration camp in Germany in 1944. Ma'akibosanu, it impedes us. Va'anachnu, we are found besakanas nefashos, we are in a life and death struggle, and therefore the Torah, Jewish law, requires that you sacrifice eating chametz, that principle, for the higher principle of saving lives. We are preparing now to fulfill l'kayim mitzvah to fulfill your divine commandment, v'chay to live by the Torah. And the Torah therefore requires us that we eat chametz to save our souls, not just our bodies, but to follow in the ways of God, even though that means transgressing what ordinarily would be a very serious transgression and to violate that for the purpose of a greater spiritual goal. We're not spiritual minimalists by eating chametz. We are spiritual maximalists. This is the greatest resilience to avoid and to avoid the transgression of not being careful about our health. And therefore, our prayer, they conclude, is that we should be alive. You should continue to keep us alive and to stand us up and to redeem us quickly so that we can observe all of your laws and to do your will, God, and to follow your, your, your belief of Shalom, your will with a full heart. Amen. So we have stories of, of resilience, not just of the joyous rabbi and the lighting of the Hanukkah candles in Westerbork, but the Dutch Jews are willing to speak out on behalf of God and have their commitment to God be so firm and unshakable that even when they have to transgress, they are still fulfilling their Jewish maximalist identity. So we're going to pause now. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free, feel free to put them in the, in the chat. So Rabbi, the first question is, um, well, actually to follow up on this one, um, could you please say the name again uh, about the, uh, the book of the Jews of the Netherlands? Okay, there are a few here. Here's the, uh, I have a little uh, bibliography which I can, I can share with you. After the Holocaust, The Bells Still Ring by Joseph Pollock in 2015. Uh, Letters from Westerbork by Eddie Hillison, 1986. And then Member Book, History of Just Dutch Jewry from the Renaissance to 1940 by Moses Hyman Gans, published in 1971. And if you want one more, there's a book by Jacob Presser called Ashes in the Wind, The Destruction of Dutch Jewry. I can send all these, uh, this little uh, bibliography over to you. Great, thank you. Next question. Uh, can you speak a little bit about uh, Zionist Jews, non-religious Jews uh, in the camps where they drew their strength and to survive? It's a great question. Uh, the question was um, about non-religious Zionist Jews. I'm not so familiar. I haven't done a, uh, much research in that in particular. One of the key elements of resilience from a spiritual standpoint that we can talk about is the idea of having an identity, having a mission, having a why to live. It's like the Viktor Frankl, you know, man and meaning. And so even if your meaning was not particularly religious, but the idea of a national Jewish identity is certainly a spiritual one. It's rooted very much in um, traditional Jewish sources and Jewish identity. 
and there were there were on the one hand uh, sometimes conflicts between uh, spiritual movements and the nationalist movements, but there were certainly those even in the deeply religious community in the deeply spiritual community who saw the roots of the national revival in the 19th century in Eastern Europe of the Jewish culture, the Jewish identity as a people of peoplehood and the aspiration to go back to a homeland, specifically to Palestine, which would ultimately become the state of Israel, as being one which is deeply rooted in the Jewish soul, even if it was being expressed in um, totally secular terms. And so the idea that that was a meaning and a purpose that galvanized people and gave them hope and something to live for is certainly something that is in consonance with a lot of the themes that we see when we talk about spiritual resistance in other contexts. Great, thank you. Next question. Uh, why do you, why are you supposed to give your life and not fast on Yom Kippur versus eating bread on Pesach? Can you speak so a little bit? So the question was, why are you supposed to give your life uh, and not fast on Yom Kippur versus uh, give your life and not give your life and eat on Pesach. And so what's remarkable about that episode is that this man, Shneel Weiss, who we mentioned, whose incredible heroism was manifest in that story, actually, technically speaking, was volunteering to give up his life. According to Jewish law, it's actually preferable to eat on Yom Kippur than give up your life. So why did he do that? We're going to talk about another story in a minute where another rabbi did something which was technically speaking not in consonance with the legal code, but was above and beyond. So that above and beyond is an example of resilience to, and that's what Rabbi uh, Spira is alluding to in that story about how he, this great grand rabbi, had such admiration for this simple non-religious Jew because this not religious Jew stood up for something that was, it was beyond even the call of duty from a religious law standpoint. Yes, if, if this, God forbid, this Yom Kippur, somebody has a health challenge, they should eat and not endanger their life. Schneeweiss should have, according to the letter of the law, especially because he himself wasn't observant, should have just sat down and ate lunch and saved his life. But because he was drawing on this inner spiritual resilience, that wouldn't allow him. He was going to go for a meta- uh, identity, so to speak, even transcending what the Jewish law calls on him for, to sacrifice his life for that principle, which was so deep rooted in him, apparently. I think people are anxious. I'm getting notes for you to keep going with your stories. Great. So let's move on. And I want to now move to uh, maybe the most famous, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to capture three stories of spiritual resistance from a death camp, right? We talked now uh, previously about concentration camps, work camps, transit camps. Now we're going to go to a death camp, the most famous of all the death camps, the Kingdom of Night of Auschwitz. Not every story that you will hear from uh, every place is always verified or verifiable, but these stories are absolutely, as far as I can uh, tell you based on the research that has been done, these are absolutely true, absolutely incredible stories. So in Auschwitz, Auschwitz, as many of you know, had several uh, sections. There was Auschwitz, there was Birkenau. Um, within this empire of darkness, of cruelty, and of destruction that uh, the Germans created in what was previously called Auschwitz, there was still spiritual resistance in different ways. So I'll give you uh, three expressions of that. One is a young woman who arrived in Auschwitz, and there's uh, some discussion about this in a book, several articles, one of them I have here in front of me. The article is entitled, it's in the Yad Vashem Studies by Alan Rosen, entitled Tracking Jewish Time in Auschwitz. Uh, Alan Rosen subsequently, I think it was earlier this past year, published this in an entire book. The idea of tracking Jewish time is about keeping a Jewish calendar. So there is a woman, her name is Sophie Solberg. Sophie Solberg grew up in Germany and she went to a, a religious Zionist camp, we call that Hachshara in Hebrew, in the countryside before the war. And in this camp, she 
was part of a young group of religious girls, young women, and they, they learned many things in terms of uh, culturally Jewish things, Zionist teachings, but they also learned about how to keep a Jewish calendar. Now, this is actually something which requires a great level of scholarship and acumen. I don't think that I could create a Jewish calendar now. Uh, so thank God we have those. But what is amazing is that this woman, after being deported from Germany, ended up in Auschwitz working in the laundry, in the laundry in Auschwitz, where she kept a calendar. She survived the war, ended up in Israel in the fall of 1945. It, the calendar became um, um, a part of an exhibit in a museum in Israel called Heichal Shlomo. And then uh, Professor Rosen got a hold of this calendar. Um, I don't actually, I should have gotten, I, I can get a, uh, there's a second calendar which he articulates in this as well. I, can, I have a picture of it somewhere, but not in here. Wait, let me see if I have a picture. No. Um, yes, it is. Hold on. It's going to be hard for you to see because it's printed out a little bit uh, gray, but you see these small scraps of paper, if you can see it on your screen. Um, this was, you see these pages uh, from the Jewish calendar of Sophie Solberg for the year 5705, which is the Jewish year 1944 to 1945. She keeps the days of the week, the Torah reading, the portion, the Sidra of that reading of that Shabbat, of that Saturday. Let me see if there's another. Yeah, there's a second calendar he references here, but this is the picture of the Sophie Solberg calendar. So if you can imagine to yourself, having no access to any scholarship or any volumes, this woman is keeping a calendar. Why is that significant? Because in Judaism, time is sacred. Despite being a prisoner, a slave, someone who was being controlled by others, by being able to mark Jewish time in Auschwitz, Sophie Solberg, this young woman, is able to go back to owning that time, demarcating it and sanctifying it. This little calendar, which was written on scraps of paper in the laundry in Auschwitz, represents and reflects this woman's commitment to resilience, to maintaining her spiritual identity, even under the absolute worst conditions. That's story number one. The Auschwitz calendar, there's a second one, but that, that's too much time for us today. The Auschwitz calendar, calendar in Auschwitz by Sophie Solberg. A second episode in Auschwitz, which I'll bring your attention to, is here in this volume called Shar Mahmadim. Shar Mahmadim is an English work. I'm going to pull up a picture of him right now on the screen for you. From a rabbinic personality in Chicago, a Chicago rabbinic personality. Hang on, let me get this um, share screen. The man you see on the screen. This is just from a simple Google search. Right here, this man, Rabbi Tzvi Hirsch Meisels, the rabbi of Weizen in Hungary. The Weizen Arav, who subsequently survives the war, survives Auschwitz, emigrates to the United States and moves here to Chicago, where he sets up a community and a school. There's actually a school that's in, set up by him uh, it's in West Rogers Park. It's called the Weizen Archader. There's also another school called Tiferes Tzvi, the crown of Tzvi, his name was Tzvi Hirsch Meisels. There are some people maybe on this call, there are many people in the community who still remember Rabbi Meisels. Rabbi Meisels went with many members of his Hungarian community, a Weizen. They went to Auschwitz, like many Hungarian Jews, hundreds of thousands of Hungarian Jews, in the summer to fall of 1944. He arrives in Auschwitz, and believe it or not, he actually still has with him in Auschwitz a shofar which is of course very timely because now we're in the period of the month of Elul, the Hebrew month that precedes Rosh Hashanah, where people are preparing to um, observe uh, Yom Tov together with uh, you know, their families and the mitzvah blowing of the shofar is certainly a central motif. It's a central point of the holiday. And here he is in Auschwitz with a shofar. And we don't have time to read all the details of the story, but he describes the most incredible, incredible episode because he had this chauffeur with him. It was before a Rosh Hashanah and there was a group of 1400 boys who had been placed in an isolated barrack. 
And they knew that they had been placed in this barrack because unfortunately, they were going to be taken to the gas chambers. They were given no food, no access to uh, drinking water. They were isolated in this barrack. This group of young boys included many people, many young men who were students of Rabbi Meisel's from his academy from before the war, from before the war in Hungary. And someone heard and got word to these boys and they had heard that Rabbi Meisel's had a chauffeur. And he describes Rabbi Meisel that he got word from someone that the boys were pleading that he please come there with his chauffeur on Rosh Hashanah to blow the chauffeur for them. They should fulfill the mitzvah of the blowing of the chauffeur. And he said he didn't know what to do. Because on the one hand, Jewish law states you're not allowed to endanger your life just for the mitzvah of the chauffeur. You should rather save your life and not blow the mitzvah of the chauffeur. But he said he couldn't hold himself back. He took his son to stand watch outside. He went to this condemned barrack with his chauffeur. And he describes in first person how he walked in there. He says, there is not a poet, writer, nor poet in the entire world who can portray my feelings as I entered the sealed barracks. It is, was only due to the miracle of God that my heart did not burst in anguish when I saw before me the bitter sea of tear stung eyes. All the children were screaming and crying terribly with burning tears and raised voices that ascended to the heart of heaven. They all pressed forward to kiss my hand, my clothing, any place they could touch me. They cried out, Rebbe, have mercy, have mercy. Many of them I knew. They'd been my students or my congregants. And the Rebbe decided he was gonna blow the shofar. But before he blew the shofar, they said, please, just like in the synagogue, you always spoke, you gave us words before the blowing of the shofar, please speak. They wouldn't let me continue to blow. And finally I relented, I spoke to them. Could you imagine giving a sermon in a block of condemned boys, wondering when the Nazis were gonna come and take them away? I cannot hold back the words. I tell the story so future generations will know the great Messiris Nefesh. What we're talking about, the resilience, the spiritual metal of these boys that I heard from these boys. Because he blows the shofar and after he's about to leave, the rabbi, one of the boys cried out, dearest of friends, the rabbi has strengthened us by telling us that even when a sharp sword is upon our throats, we should not despair of mercy. But I say to you that we can hope for the best when we must prepare for the worst, said this young man. For the sake of Hashem, for God, my brothers, let us not forget in our last moments, cry out, Shema Yisrael, with sincere devotion. And the Weizner Rav says he saw and heard with his own eyes as all these boys cried out together, Shema Yisrael. And that was the end. But shortly thereafter, after this 24 hours, they had not had any food or anything to drink. They were taken away. They were taken away. And they were all gassed and burned. Resilience, could you imagine? to cry out Shema Yisrael, so many, and this is just, it's, it's an example that there are countless of, many, many stories of people crying out Shema, the ancient prayer of hero Israel, the Lord is our God, Hashem is our God. There is one God, even if we can't understand, God is one. There is one God, even in that hell of Auschwitz. I'll conclude with one more story from Auschwitz, spiritual metal. This is very, very powerful work. It's very difficult, but it's very powerful. It's called We Wept Without Tears, Testimonies of the Jewish Sonder Commando in Auschwitz by Gidon Greif, who went around Israel interviewing survivors of the Sonder Commando. These were the men who worked in the crematoria, extracting the teeth, burning the bodies, and they lived quasi more normal lives than the rest of the prisoners in Auschwitz. Well, believe it or not, some of the men who worked in the Sonder Commando actually buried items during their time working in the crematoria, living nearby. And some of these were documents that were collected in this work called the Scrolls of Auschwitz. Each of these books needs you know, a lifetime of study. The Scrolls of Auschwitz were collections of works put together by a Russian survivor by the name of Bearmark that was finished by his wife Esther of things that were buried in and around the crematoria religious items like tefillin, phylacteries, phylacteries that men wrap around their arm for prayer. In addition, there were several um, scrolls or, or pieces of paper documenting things that were happening. One of these documents that was found is written by a man, a rabbi from a Polish town called Makov. His name was Rav Arye Leib Langfus. Rav Arye Leib Langfus. Rav Leib Langfus was a rabbi, a rabbinical judge in Makov, who then ends up 
working as a Sonder commando. He was actually there through the revolt and then was liquidated shortly thereafter. He was living and working as a Sonder commando, but also transcribing. He wrote down what it was like in the deportation from Makov and also some of the things that were happening there at the moment, this is a contemporaneously written document which was buried in the ground and found later. Some of the uh, uh, documents that were found were actually incredible uh, woman, Esther Bear, who figured out some of the documents that didn't have names on them had a little name on the bottom, Aleph, Lamed, Resh Aleph, A-L-R-A. -A. And people, scholars couldn't figure out who was writing these documents, but she figured it out. Aleph, Lamed, A-L is Arye Leib, Resh, R, A, Aleph, Resh Aleph stands for Regel Aroch. Regel means foot, Aroch means long, long foot, in Yiddish, Langfus. These were secret documents that Rabbi Ari Leib Langfus had written. So this man is the religious, spiritual leader, so to speak, of the Sandra Commando. And what's amazing is not just his description, which we don't have time to focus on today, uh, was, is the description of one of the Sonder Commando, whose name was Yankel Silberberg. Yankel Silberberg is working in the ghetto. So what you could do is you actually take these two books and you put them together to get a complete picture. This book is the description of Rabbi Eile Blankfuss's writings. And this one is the interview with the Sonder Commando. So Yankel Silberberg describes how that he was in the Sonder Commando and he heard from another guy by the name of Shlomo Kirschbaum who told me that, quote, the Dayan from Makov was one, it was at one of the large crematoria and I should speak to him. Why did Yankel Silverberg need to speak to the Dayan of Makov, to the religious leader? Because he had a conundrum. He had a spiritual resilience conundrum. Yankel Silverberg was a Kohen. It means he came from the priestly Jewish tradition, the descendants of the high priest of Aaron. And these priests, we, I happen to be from a family of Kohanim, a Kohen is not allowed to come in contact, according to Jewish law, with a corpse. And now he's working in the Sandra Commando. What does he do? I was a Kohen. I was torn. The work I had to do was contrary to everything I'd believed all my life. So you know what he did? He went to ask a Shaila, a rabbinic question, to the Dayan of Makov. So the interviewer, Gideon Greif, says to him, so you felt it was important to receive an answer for rabbinical authority? Yes, said Yankel. I also asked him lots of other questions about these matters. Had you known the Dayan previously? Was he famous? Definitely. What did he tell you? And listen to this answer. He said, don't worry. We are here to do God's mission. God wants it this way, and we have to take this action because it's a mitzvah, religious imperative. It's imperative. It's the Creator's will. It's not within our power to change His will, just as we have no control over His decisions. He also told me that, in his opinion, what we were doing was a mitzvah because, in this manner, the Jews were given some sort of burial. Says Gidon Greif, were you satisfied with his explanation? I must have been satisfied at the time. A person tends to trust someone who is greater than him, who is authoritative, who can understand, and who can tell good from evil. Then he goes on to describe the rest of the conversations. But what's amazing to me is that this man, literally, in the nadir of hell, in the crematoria, is resilient enough to say he wants to maintain his identity as a Jewish priest, as a Kohen. And the same way that according to Jewish law, a Kohen, if they find a dead person, a deceased, strewn along the way, it's called a mace mitzvah, it's a mitzvah to bury that person, this, so to speak, was his own form of fulfilling that religious commandment and maintaining his spiritual sense even in the depths of Auschwitz. Auschwitz. So the three Auschwitz stories today is the story of the calendar kept by Sophie Solberg, the chauffeur of the Weizner Rav, and the Kohen, the religious uh, priest in the crematoria of Yankel Solberg. Let's uh, take some questions now. We'll conclude over the next couple of minutes. Sure, thank you, Rabbi. And the first one is, um, is the calendar from Auschwitz in a museum that you know of? Are we able to see it? So um, it's property of Sophie Solberg. I have to check back where exactly it is now. I think it was in Hechel Shoma for a time. I'm not sure. I can get you the, um, the name of this book. 
the new book by Professor Rosen. Hold on one second, you know what? I can get a few right now while we're talking. In there, he has access. I think he tells you where it is. Let's see, the new book is called, okay. The Holocaust's Jewish Calendar, Keeping Time Sacred, Making Time Holy, published uh, February 28th, 2019. Uh, you can get it actually on Amazon on a Kindle, or you can get the hardcover for, it's not cheap, it's like, oh, the paperback is uh, $35. So it's not super expensive for those who are interested. You can get it on Amazon by Alan Rosen. So there you can actually see the calendar and read all about it in that volume. Oh, terrific, thank you. Uh, the next uh, comment is a comment and then a follow-up question. Uh, first, uh, these stories of spiritual resistance cannot be told too often in the face of today's pandemic and in the anti-Semitism we are currently experiencing and in the future we yet to know. So that was someone's comment and it sparked another question. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, which is many of us know, have family and friends and know people from our community who are survivors. And this pandemic has hit really hard for many of them. What words, what words of wisdom can you share as we try to comfort those who had to find resilience in many years ago and are having a tough time drawing it up one more time. It's a really difficult question. There was an article recently on Times of Israel. I did not realize there are still 175,000 Holocaust survivors living in the state of Israel, and they interviewed several of them who are struggling with exactly this issue of feeling isolated and lonely. They, inter they interviewed one woman. I can send you the article. You can Google it on Times of Israel uh, from, I think it was from June. They interviewed one woman who's sitting alone in her apartment in Tel Aviv and struggling with this. You know, I'm not old and I'm not wise. I don't have a lot of life experience. I'm just a student. Uh, I would say though that staying connected, you know, we can connect with people if it's dropping something at their door, if it's sending them a text message, if it's calling them, you know, whatever we can do uh, the research and psychology research shows that being connected makes people feel less overwhelmed. Imagine we were standing at the base of a mountain. This is a great experiment. My professor, my teacher, Dr. David Pelkovitz, loves to talk about. And we were asked, uh, let's say, um, Megan, I, I'm going to call you out because you're on this call. Megan is standing next to a mountain and she's asked, can you estimate the height of this mountain? But you know what it would be? If she was standing next to Linda, if you were standing next to her, she would estimate that the mountain is actually less high than if she were estimating it by herself. Because when we have companionship, when we have togetherness, when we don't feel alone and we don't feel lonely, we feel stronger. We feel like we can conquer that mountain. So for those of us who know Holocaust survivors and who are blessed to have them in our lives, just making sure that we reach out to make sure that they feel connected. Different people cope with uh, challenges in different ways. So I guess every circumstance is gonna be different, but the notion of, making sure people feel a sense of community and connection, whatever that community looks like and however that connection can be created, it would seem to me is probably a valuable opportunity and a, and a gift that we can give them for I don't know how many more years. Rabbi, I think you're far too humble. Those were beautiful words to really help many people right now. One more question. Uh, and this one is, um, about you. <laughs> uh, how did you become interested in studying spiritual resistance during the Holocaust? Was there a particular story you heard or a personal experience that has inspired you? So that'll be our last question for the day and I'm very honored and grateful that somebody uh, took that interest. I don't know exactly at what point I became interested in studying spiritual resistance. Uh, I feel in many respects that I have a, a deep connection to my past. Uh, my grandparents who are all in the next world are a big part of my life. I think of them all the time. Some of them came from Poland. Some of them came from Russia. 
extended parts of our family were killed out in the Holocaust. I've always been connected to tradition and stories have always resonated with me. And so one of the stories, and I'll end with this in the book, in the Hasidic tales of the Holocaust, one of the beginning stories about the Blujever was that he was standing at the edge of a pit in Janowska and they were being told they had to jump over the pit. And anybody who didn't make it over the pit, would get, they would end in that pit with a bullet. And he was standing next to a man, Rabbi Spear was standing next to a man who we knew from before the war, who was not, not religious, he was an academic. And they were standing next to each other. And finally they get to the edge of the pit and I'll say very briefly, they jumped over and they look at each other afterwards and the man says to Rabbi Spira, how did you jump over? It's like superhuman. Rabbi Spira says, I closed my eyes and I held on to the coattails of my father. And that carried me across. And Rabbi Spira says to the man, how did you get across? He says, I closed my eyes and I held on to your coattails. And in many respects, so many of these stories, I close my eyes and I hold on to their coattails. And I try to share them with all of you and with our children and with our community so that we can be inspired to hold on to their coattails. That's part of how I believe in God and believe in the tradition is that we have this unbroken chain of heroes, everyday heroes, regular, you know, authentic Jews, rabbis, all kinds of people who could take us all the way back from generation to generation, something that animates my Judaism today. So it's been a journey for me and it's been an honor to be a part of that journey with all of you. I see some names here. Uh, I'm sending my love to all of our members of our regular study group, and I look forward to seeing you all soon. And I thank you for having me, and I wish all of you Shana Tova, and thank you again, Linda and Megan, and, and everybody in the museum for having me today. Well, Rabbi, we thank you. What an inspiring and powerful hour of learning we've just had with you. <clears throat> thank you stay, so stay, very much. Stay in touch, um, everybody. Feel free, if anybody wants to reach me, uh, you can reach me probably the best way um, is by email. So I'm gonna put my email in the, in the line here for those who are part of our regular study group, you have it. But if anybody else wants to reach out, don't hesitate to reach out with any question, comment, thought, observation, glad to hear from you. So thank you everyone for coming and have a great day. Oh, thank you again. For those of you still on the line, please, we would greatly appreciate it if you would take one minute and click on the survey that is in the chat box. This helps us uh, plan for the future to meet your needs. And it also allows us information to help uh, with funders. So uh, I'd appreciate that very much. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Have a great day.